but economics and the future. Uh, so just to go over the story so far, um, we have solar power, at least for plants, for over 2,000 million years. The sun has been beating on the earth and turning, making complex hydrocarbons. Um, this is where we get oil and coal and gas from today. Um, humans have been getting power from food for around 5 million years. Um, and this is also solar power. Um, and fire, around 400,000 years ago, humans discovered fire or invented fire, discovered fire. Um, this means, um, one thing this means is that we can cook food and cooking food means we take less time to eat. If you cook food, you can eat it more quickly. You can eat more, more energy in less time. Um, it also means more food is available for humans. Um, so fire is, is quite an important development in our history. Um, more recently, uh, we started to use fire for steam um, and steam for energy. Um, and this is uh, James, usually we talk about James Watt and the Watt steam engine. Um, from this point, humans have started to use a lot more energy. And um, this has been very good in some ways. Um, it's also had some problems. Um, the problem, well, there was a, the oil has gone from 2,000 barrels in 1859. Um, in 1859, oil was discovered in Pennsylvania. And um, it went up in 10 years to 4 million barrels. So that's quite a big increase in the amount of oil. Um, this, of course, along with coal, along with large cities with many people, has caused air pollution. Uh, 1952, the Great Smog of London, um, 4,000 to 12,000 people died from air pollution. Um, and this led to the Clean Air Act in England. Um, other countries also have um, clean air and laws against burning dirty fuel. Um, then another event in the energy history is uh, the oil shock of the 1970s. This caused a massive rise in oil prices around the world, again in 1979. And um, this led in Europe to uh, low energy building standards. Um, in Japan, this led to making very energy efficient products, including electronic goods and including cars. Um, so we now start thinking beyond fire and start thinking about carbon. 1972, there was a report from the Club of Rome about global warming and the effects of burning too much carbon. Um, the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, started in 1988. Uh, we've known about this stuff for a while. By 2015, um, we estimate there's around one degree of warming. So the globe, the, the world has become one degree warmer from our burning of fossil fuels. Um, also in 2015, the um, Paris Agreement uh, was to keep warming well below 2 degrees centigrade. Um, also in two 2015, uh, in many countries in the world, solar panels, the cost of solar panels has reached the same as the cost of conventional energy. Um, so we have some of the problems we know very well, um, some of the solutions we also know, and there has been some agreement. Um, the five years since 2015 
have had some problems. Um, we look to be back towards working with Paris and towards most of the governments in the world agreeing that we need to do something to reduce carbon dioxide. Um, so the question then is, what is next? Um, I cannot see the future, uh, but I can uh, talk about some predictions about the future. And I'm just going to go back in time to look at some things that some people said. And this is a kind of quiz. I, you need to uh, try and work out who said these things. Um, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Everything that can be invented has been invented. Um, these are all people in the, these are mostly people in the 1800s and the first half of the 20th century. Um, who said, who said these things? There is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Uh, 640k, 640 kilobytes, ought to be enough for anybody. Data processing is a fad that won't last out the year. Um, who said what? Uh, these are all also 20th century. Um, who said these things? Um, off you go and try and guess who said what. Then we'll tell you more later. Predicting the future, um, there are some very clever people who have made some very stupid predictions about the future. Uh, it's very difficult to, to say exactly what will happen in the future. And um, here are some um, examples. The IBM chairman back in 1943, uh, he said there was perhaps a world market for five computers. Now, at the time, a computer was a very large and very expensive thing. And this is perhaps a reasonable prediction. A few years later, though, um, uh, this was a valve. This is a transistor. And the invention of the transistor made it possible to make computers and to make small and cheap computing devices. Um, there was a a quote from someone else at IBM, um, but what is it good for? Um, and this was a question about the microchip. Um, and we now have microchips in our phones, in our watches, in many devices around us. Um, and the 1960s, the in integrated circuit. Um, so this is Moore's law, and this shows the power of computers and that's the number of transistors on a computer chip. And this is um, going up every every year or two. And we can see it going from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 to a million, 10 million, 100 million, a billion. And it, it seems to keep going up. Um, and this means that computers become more powerful. It means computers become cheaper. Um, and... This applies to many, many electronic devices because now there's a computer in many, many things. Um, similar, There's a similar trend for LEDs. Um, this is uh, LED lighting uh, compared to conventional lighting. The advantages with LEDs are there's low energy. Um, they don't radiate heat. Uh, so in the summer, LEDs are cooler. It's cool light. They're relatively small. Um, they're long-lasting 
and they don't attract insects so much as conventional lighting. The disadvantages, the problems with them, um, they can't dim, they're limited colours and they're expensive. Um, in fact, um, LEDs can dim. Now, the early LEDs could not dim. Now they have the technology. And now there's a range of colours that you can get LEDs in. Um, and the cost as well has been coming down for LEDs in the last few years. And again, will probably can't continue to, to go down. Uh, this is, um, I think this is called Haight's Law or Haight's Law. And there's a similar law to Moore's law for LEDs, uh, which is the amount of lighting power per package. Um, which this has been going up again from um, from one to ten to a hundred to a thousand to ten thousand, and so on. Um, so also LEDs are coming down in price and increasing in the amount of light power they can give us. Um, so these these things, some things about the future then are predictable. We can predict some trends. Uh, some things are not predictable. Um, if we go back to the 1970s, um, when they talk about a zero heating building. Now, in the 1970s, they would have 100 watt light bulbs. And um, if you have a 100 watt light bulb in each room, then you can say your house is zero heating. Um, a house today, the whole house, the LEDs use less um, than a hundred watts. And um, this is just this is an example of um, the the um, efficiency of LED lighting. Now, this is a camping device that uses a candle to power a. There's a candle in there, and there's a thermocouple next to the candle. And the thermocouple powers the LED. And we can see that the LED is much, much brighter than the candle. Um, so we can see the development of lighting technology and how it's all about energy. And the light um, coming from this LED is coming from the heat that the candle puts out. And of course, candles, um, I suppose, are made for lighting but they're very, very inefficient. Most of the energy in a candle goes into heat. A tiny amount goes into light. And if we can take that heat, put it through a thermocouple, thermocouples are not very efficient, and we put that through an LED, then it will be much, much brighter than the candle. So we can see, um, we can see how things develop um, over those years and over these different types of technology. And more efficient technology, um, if it uses less energy, if it's more efficient, then we will start using it. Um, so let's just look at the um, life cycle analysis then. And uh, this is, um, we saw this for talking about generating energy. Um, this kind of applies to any kind of any system that uses energy, um, that we need to look at how much energy we use to make the system, how much energy is used when we run the system, how much energy to decommission the system. Um, we can also look at a similar um, cost. We can look at the cost of making something and the cost of running something. Um, and we can turn this into yen or dollars rather than energy. Um, life cycle analysis looks at um, positive and negative impacts. So during manufacture, while we're making something, while we're installing it, while we're using it, while we're decommissioning it, and while we're disposing of it. So we need to look at the energy or we need to look at the cost throughout this cycle. Um, and this is the kind of question that we may come across. So... Um, here is a roll of insulation and here is some kerosene, some, some heating fuel. Um, for about around 6,000 yen, we could get this big roll of glass wool or we could get the um, paraffin. Um, and just to give more details, that's glass wool. It's 11 metres long um, and... 910 millimeters wide 
and that's 90 litres of paraffin. Um, so, which one should you buy? Um, and how do you calculate this? How do you work out in numbers um, the value of the glass wool on one side and how do you compare that with the kerosene? Um, so we need to think about the steps of problem solving. Um, we need to work out what the problem is, plan a strategy to solve the problem. We need some equations. Um, we need to find some data. We need to calculate and check and then check again. Um, and I think probably the way, the thing to look for in this problem is the return on investment. Um, in other words, how many years will it take um, before the total running costs equal the initial costs? So you're looking at a comparison. The um, insulation is a one-time cost that will save heat over many years. Um, the kerosene is a, like a running cost. So we use the kerosene and it will heat us, it will keep us warm for a certain length of time. When we finish burning the kerosene, um, it'll stop keeping us warm. The insulation, on the other hand, once the insulation is installed, it will keep us going, it'll keep us warm for as long as it's there, as long as it's in our walls or in our roof. Um, so, um, how much heat will the insulation stop? Um, how much heat will the paraffin produce, will the kerosene produce? Um, and how many years is that? Can we put this into years? Um, so, what do you need to know? Um, this is some data that you'll probably need to know. Um, the paraffin, kerosene, has about 9.8 kilowatt hours per litre. Uh, we've got 90 litres of that. Uh, that's just the energy. Um, paraffin heater efficiency, um, don't know, let's say 100%. Let's assume that all of this paraffin will turn into heat. Um, glass wool has a U value of 0.44, if it's 100 millimeters thick, that's 0.44 watts per square meter per Kelvin. Um, here in Matsumoto, it's 80 kilokelvin hours per year. Um, and that's about 10 square meters of glass wool. So that's how much area. Um, here was the equation for the heat loss um, for how many kilowatt hours per year. Uh, just remember though, um, we need to compare, we need like a before and after. And let's assume that we're starting with walls that have one watt per square meter Kelvin. So let's start with not very good insulating walls. Um, and you'll need to work out how much heat we're losing to start with. And then let's add the insulation to our wall. You probably remember this for insulation in series. Um, so what's the new U value? And what's the saving? compared to our walls with no insulation. Um, so which one should you buy? Um, off you go and think about this problem. So which one should we get? Should we get the glass wool or should we get the heating oil? Um, the calculation for uh, the U value, um, we're starting with a U value of one. We can work out the new U value, which is 0 0.31. And so the difference then is 0 0.69. So we can quite simply work out um, that's how many kilowatt hours per year 
we will stop losing if we add this extra insulation. Um, we can then look at the paraffin. The kerosene has uh, 90 litres, 9.8 kilowatt hours per litre. So that's about 880 kilowatt hours of energy. Um, so the payback is 1.6 years. So if you're staying in your house for more than 1.6 years, it's worth getting insulation. If you're only going to be there for one year, it's cheaper to buy the paraffin. Um, there are some extras. Uh, of course, the paraffin, you can't just buy the paraffin and leave it in your room. You need a heater to burn the paraffin safely. Um, did we include all the costs? Are there some hidden costs of paraffin? Um, what about carbon emissions? So paraffin puts out uh, lots of carbon when we burn it. Um, are we properly accounting for the cost of the carbon? Um, of course, everything puts out carbon. Um, if we just look at the carbon costs, so if we're not so worried about money, if we're just worried about what is better for the environment, should we use, um, should we be insulating or should we be using paraffin, um, then this is about 14 kilograms of carbon dioxide is emitted producing glass wool, whereas it's a quarter of a tonne, around 250 kilograms for this paraffin, this kerosene. So it's about 20 times more carbon dioxide comes out of the paraffin. Um, so if we're just thinking about the carbon, then um, it's 20 times faster for the payback. So this means that about in about one month, we've saved the carbon from using the kerosene, from not using the kerosene, from, from buying glass wool. Um, so there are also some insulation extras. Um, and we need to think about two things. We need to actually install the insulation. Again, you can't just buy insulation and leave it in the corner of your room. You need to put it on your wall walls um, and it will cost money to put it in. Um, you need insulation everywhere. So you can't just insulate 10 square meters of one of your walls. You need to insulate all of the walls um, and the roof probably, maybe the floor as well. Um, so this will probably take more than 10 square meters. Um, another important thing to think about is when we did our calculation, oh, we well, we assumed that there was, we had a one, a wall with no insulation to start with. Um, in fact, if you already have some insulation on your wall, as you add more insulation, uh, there is less effect. Um, there's less heat to save as the wall gets thicker. So the first 100 millimetres of insulation will save about 69%. The next one will be only 41%. The next one, if you do another 100 millimetres of insulation, will only be 29%. Um, so it depends where you're starting and how much insulation and how much will make a difference. Another very important thing to think about is if you have an insulated house, then it will probably be warmer. And of course, this is this is a great thing. But if you have, uh, for the calculation, um, this is assuming that it's 20 degrees centigrade inside all the time. But if your house is not insulated, um, it will not be 20 degrees all the time. If you don't insulate your house, you only switch on the heating when you need it. Um, when you're out in the daytime, you don't leave the heating on. You may only heat one room in your house. Um, if you're not in the other room, you may not heat the other room. Um, so this makes a difference to our calculation. And it makes a difference to um, whether it's worth insulating.
Uh, here are some references. And that's all for now.